Join me as I explore the exciting world of model railways with behind the scenes features, step-by-step -step tutorials, interviews, videos, reviews, and much, much more. I'm Dawn Quest and I love building model railways. Now he's a magazine editor, a model railway enthusiast, and a chiclet author. Who knew? Earlier, I spoke to Phil Parker, editor of Garden Rail Magazine, features editor of BRM, and he told me all about his passion for model railways, what he really thinks about Hornby's The Wonderworks, and top tips on how to get your layout featured in his magazine. Phil, lovely to talk to you today. So let's start at the beginning. Tell me about your first loco and your first layout. My, my first loco, that's a, that's a nice easy one. My first loco was a Triang 3F. Um, it was second hand. My dad had repainted it into a sort of maroon color and it ran around a track which had got a couple of sidings on it that uh, that we, we put on a, a board in the corner of my bedroom. Uh, I had some, let's see, I had the Triang 3F. I had some Graham Farish 00 wagons. Shocked you, shocked some people. They're going, Graham Farish 00. Yeah, Graham Farish used to do a 00 range. I have some Graham Farish 00 wagons and a Hornby brake fan, I think. But the Hornby brake fan, the body fell off. And so I rebuilt it as, a, um, as, a, as an open wagon. Um, wildly inaccurately, but I didn't care at the time. So that, that was that was my first, like everybody else, I had a train that went round and round and round in circles. And I loved it and I made stuff and it had Lego buildings on it. And, uh, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it and it sort of grew from there. Fantastic. I always really love hearing about people's first layouts and their first locos. And so here you are now, editor of Garden Rail Magazine, features editor at BRM, and of course, moderator on RM Web. Tell me about that career progression all the way from that first model, that first layout, all the way to where you are now. It was 40 years ago this year. My dad and I joined the local model railway club, the Leamington Orient Model Railway Society. At that time, it was down in a ba in a damp basement in the top of town. Uh, and that got me, you know, who was quite a very shy child, got me um, exhibiting. And so essentially, my dad and I built... Our first layout, the Cayward, Wistow and Selby Light Railway, we made all our mistakes, loads and loads of them, um, lo loads and loads of mistakes. Um, and then we went and built a layout called Melbridge Dock, which we deliberately designed to be small. It was six foot long and it was industrial in an era when most people built branch line terminuses. What got me started, uh, my very, very first article uh was because we took uh melbridge to a show and i can't remember which show it was parked up in the uh, in a little chef on the way home came out found a hole in the back window of the van the stock box had gone the toolbox had gone my camera bag had gone um basically somebody had broken in they tried to steal the exhibition box was too big to go out the window and my first article for brm was uh because i just it, it was brm was relatively new on the newsstands at that point and uh so we were reading that and so i sent them i said i'd like to write an article about dealing with the insurance companies and all the stuff you could learn from having your stock stolen not a pleasant thing but it was different and the editor at the time david brown um took that up yep we did it i had two pages in brm it was the i, I was really impressed I haunted Smiths for days, waiting for the issue to come out. Um, I think I bought myself a Backman Standard tank with the uh, with the money they sent me. I did a few more for David. Um, I am still officially the telephone box correspondent at the BRM um, because I did a box. I did a thing on telephone boxes in the mid nineteen nineties. Um, there was this new thing called blogs appeared, late nineties. And I thought that looks really interesting because it was simplifying the whole process of getting online. Also, I wrote a blog about my model making. Um, at the time, I did a little bit of model making for other people, so it helped keep them up to date with what I was doing. And I just intermittently wrote the uh, wrote the blog. And out of that, um, I was doing Wally with Melbridge Dock, and Mike Wild um, came around the back of the uh, layout and had a chat with me about featuring the layout in the magazine. Now, to be fair, he came around, had a chat with me about featuring the layout in the magazine, and then we spent loads of time talking about old Volkswagens because that's an interest we share. Um, he'd seen my blog and he knew I could write because I was churning out content two or three times a week. Um, I could take the photos. I'd had the practice with that sort of thing. I could do the, I could do the modelling to the standard. So 
Um, essentially, he asked me, he offered me the chance to do a monthly column called Parker's Guide. And uh, so for a few years, I did Parker's Guide in Hormie magazine. And eventually, uh, the people at Warner's were looking to, um, this was this was all freelance. I was doing other jobs. It wasn't my main job. It was just something I did on the sidelines. Um, and the people at Warner's approached me and said, look, we want to completely revamp BRM. And one of the things we need is a practical guy. Would you like to come and join us? But I started like a lot of people do. I was freelance and I churned out articles for people. Um, and I, you know, you learn, you learn to take the photos, you learn to do the commercial stuff. You, you learned that you had to write commercial stuff. Um, and yeah, essentially I, I did the work and eventually ended up in this exalted position here. Indeed. And um, what an exalted position that is. You're the man that holds all the secrets, what the big players in the model railway hobby are getting up to. I'm sure everyone wants to know. Another thing everyone would love to know, I'm sure a question I get asked a lot is, what does it take to have your layout featured in BRM magazine, Garden Rail magazine, other magazines? What are your views? What's your advice? The the picking of the layout is, um, it's, it, it's a slightly random process. One, one of the joys of um, working, working uh, the job I do is that I actually have a lot of control over what I do because there's a very small team. There are essentially me, my boss, Debbie, who is our, who is our content controller, stroke editor, and Andy York, who is, who is our other photographer and does all the reviews. Um, so really, they, you know, they, they, it's, it's very much a case of they brought us on board because we can go and do stuff and we can just go off and do it um, and be trusted to not go completely cra crazy. Um, this said, this from a man who took photos at York of a um, of a uh, layout that is all about Wiley Coyote, um, but we still published it. <laughs> um, no, um, to get your, to get your layout into a magazine isn't actually that hard. The first stage is people always ask me, and I say, look, send us two or three photos of the layout uh, so that we can so we can assess it. Uh, if you're one of these people who are going to say, oh, you really like to photograph my layout and you won't send us any photos, we're a bit stuck. To be brutally honest, um, we actually need to see what we're looking at. Uh, now, I big fan of all layouts. All layouts, you definitely can learn something from. There isn't a layout you can't go to. You can't go to a show and not look at every layout and not learn a little bit from some of them, um, and get something of them. The thing we have to bear in mind is it is going to need to look good on the page, and the camera is very, very cruel to stuff. Um, I always give the example that uh, years ago we featured a layout, an engaged layout, where all the locos were beautiful CJM models. Now, CJM were no longer around, but they did the most stunning diesels. Unfortunately, um, that was the best thing about the layout because the track looked like it had been ballasted with something from a garden centre and all the buildings are wonky. Um, so it wasn't the greatest layout shoot in the world. Um, but it doesn't need to be the highest quality modelling in the world to get through onto the page. Uh, what it needs to be is competent modelling, tidy, tidy really matters. So things not being wonky makes an enormous difference. Uh, neat ballasting helps enormously because, again, that's something the camera shows up. And, um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I prefer my personal preference is for weathered stuff. I think it looks odd. I have done shoots with it where the layout has been weathered and the stock hasn't. And it always looks a bit odd to me. It's it's very difficult to pin down exactly what works on the page, but the crucial thing we want is we want to make sure that it does look good on the page. Our, our job is to, I always say to people, our job is to make your layout look amazing, right? Because if you look amazing, then the magazine looks amazing. <laughs> uh, there, is a, there, is, there is method to around this. We, we don't fiddle with the work. We don't fiddle with the modelling. So if there's something wrong, then we will do something. Then, then to be honest, it's going to be wrong on the page. Um, we do do things like we dust thing. We we will take out the worst of the dust and cobwebs and that sort of thing because sometimes you just don't see them until you've done the photos. Uh, but generally, we do not do very much. We do we do the minimum amount of image manipulation going on there. So what you see is very much what you get. But having said that, we know how to be kind to you. And we now be kind to your layout and make you look good because ultimately that is what we want. We're particularly keen if you if it's nailed to the wall. Um, we were we are particularly keen to come and see it because obviously you know it's less it, it's less of an issue um, because you know less people are going to see it. But any layout that's worth its salt will do probably all of, certainly more than one magazine shoot, and it will and there's quite a lot will do all the magazines, which is absolutely fine. Now, Phil, not only are you the editor of Garden Rail magazine and features editor at BRM, 
but you're also a co-moderator of RM Web, that popular forum. We've all been on it. 25,000 subscribers, is that right? About 25,000 people. And, you know, I, I always say most of them, absolutely most of them are all fine and they get along chatting. There is some amazing modeling on RM Web. We now have a, a, a usually a regular four page feature in BRM where we pick up some of the images that appear on RM web of really excellent modeling. And yeah, there are some incredibly helpful people. There are people, you know, you, you can ask questions and you will get at least 12 different answers and then you can pick the answer that works best for you. But I always say there's more than one way of doing anything. And um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 we do have various discussions on, on ready to run models. That's usually where the grumpiness happens. And uh, our job is just to uh, wind people back a little bit. Not that we have a problem with criticism of manufacturers. And actually, you talk to them, most of them don't have a problem with that. They accept that people will have opinions about the stuff. Um, but every so often, sometimes these things get a little bit, a little bit rowdy, and uh, we, one of us, one of us, will just step in and calm it down a little bit, and then hopefully off it goes, and we can forget about it. People get very passionate about model railways, don't they? And I think RM Web absolutely reflects that passion. What do you think it is about model railways, locos, that ignites people, that gets people fired up? I think it's just having an interest. Um, people, th this is something pe some people care about, and people care about it in different ways. Uh, yeah, you know, some people this is absolutely everything. You know, it's 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 really a quite an all-consuming hobby. Um, other people, you know, it's a very much more casual thing, and they drop into our own web. They yeah, they might some of them will be running a modeling blog, and that's all they want to get involved with. Um, and they come in, they put this stuff on, and people do it. It's it doesn't matter what forum though it is. I mean, I was quite surprised. I, I had quite an interesting conversation at Wally with Kathy Millett and we got talking about sci-fi stuff. And all I realized was that we're not even in the same ballpark as the sci-fi people over passion and, and, and arguing over detail. You know, I mean, at least when we argue over the number of rivets on the front of a locomotive, you can physically go and check. These are people who are arguing over, uh, arguing over completely made up stuff but they are absolutely passionate about it and they will and, and that that always spills over into you know entertaining and slightly animated discussions it's just it's not model railways it is just people love it yeah science fiction that's a whole other world literally of passion and pain i guess so i know that a lot of people that i talk to would be very interested to know about your work what it takes to be a magazine editor, what your day looks like. And, you know, for journalists like us, what it takes to be in the industry. And if anyone's really interested in pursuing that career, what would your advice be? What does your day look like? No two days are the same. Um, at, right at this moment, I have got all the articles for Garden Rail over with the designer. And I'm waiting for him to, put, to, to lay them out. And once they come back, I will then reproof them because I've already gone through an, an editing sweep on the on the first the first things, and I've gone through and I've sorted out all the photos. So, you know, if they've supplied me too many photos, I worked out which ones I want. I've edited the photos because I'm better at Photoshop than most of them are. So I'll take out backgrounds and tidy things up. And we garden round style is we have a lot of if it's a practical, we try and put a lot of the stuff on white backgrounds so that it you so that you can focus on the um, on on what's going on rather than um that somebody sat it on uh, somebody sat it on their kitchen hob which always seems to be a weird one people photograph things on their hob um and it's like right well that's good. i've got to sit down and draw around that and cut that out and uh and wish photoshop's background cutting out was better um so that's that, that's that's the sort of thing so i'm where i am with that one at the moment is i'm waiting for that to come back so um at the moment, I am going to, to once once I finish this, uh, I've got some video I shot last week going around the Hornby uh, Hornby Wonderworks. Uh, I've got to see if I can turn something out with that. Yesterday, I did a an unboxing on a class that on a on a one thirty second class thirty seven diesel engine um, from uh, Westhill Wagon Works. So you know, it depends. There is. When I when I joined this, right, what I did was I built things, I took photos, I wrote them up, and that was it. Now, 
Um, there's a lot more video work involved. BRM was very ahead of the game on this one. We introduced a DVD many, many years ago. I think it must be about eight or nine years ago that was stuck to the cover of the magazine. So we had to do more video work. You know, suddenly we were told, "Oh, you're going to be going and you're going to be going filmed and stuff." And it was like, "Really? Who told me that? Who, whose idea was that?" Uh, we had to go and learn how to put together something for film. Uh, did that. Um, we now do all our own shooting. We do a lot more of it. We we do a lot more video work because we have so many channels. I mean, it's not just when I started. We did a magazine, that was it, and we did twelve magazines a year. We now do thirteen magazines a year. We do. Uh, we have World of Railways and various video channels that go out with along with the magazine. So the digital version of the magazine will have extras in it, which will be videos we've shot. Um, the traditionally we have BRM TV, which includes three videos. What used to be the DVD, um, we very very rarely put DVDs in the front cover nowadays. COVID kind of knocked that on the head because we just couldn't get them produced. Um, and then the rest of the world moved on, and people stopped having DVD players. You find you find me a computer nowadays with a DVD player in it. Um, and people stream stuff. So we stick it all on YouTube in a private area for BRM subscribers. So they get three videos a month, which means we've got to produce three videos a month. Now, it's February's one is Humbrol Smart Mud um, because I've not found any video use of it. So I did a practical with Humbrol Smart Mug, Mud and uh, off I did was I've gone and done the video to show how to use it. There's no two ways about it. I mean, some days I'm out on the road. I'm out doing, um, out going and seeing um, layout shoots. I do, there's quite a bit of weekend stuff goes on because I do go with my garden rail, with my garden rail tweed jacket on, I uh, I, I go out to all the garden rail shows uh, because it's really important to go and talk to people. But this whole industry is very much about people. It's not, it, we, we think it's about trains. It's not just about trains. It's about the people behind them. There are no two days that are the same. Um, some of them are weirder than others. I've always, I, I, I've usually got the most, most interesting week when I go to the pub. <laughs> yes, I bet. I bet there are many people who'd love to know the secrets that you're keeping about what's happening in the industry. Speaking about that, I know there's some information that you can't divulge, but what kind of trends and developments do you see coming down the track, pardon the pun, in the model railway hobby? I, yeah, it, it's very difficult because I think there are much wider what what we're seeing is that there's much more ready to run being produced in four bill that is looking at weird stuff i personally i have no interest in um very conventional branch line it's not the sort of thing i like to build that's not this it doesn't mean it's not the sort of thing i don't build for the magazine they're very different beasts um one of the things you have to get your head around if you're going if you want to have a go at this sort of thing is that um you will find that you need you end up if if you're doing it regularly you will find you're doing stuff specifically for a magazine for for publication um and it may not be the stuff that you would automatically want to do but as far as the hobby goes there are more manufacturers out there more and more of them um anybody can be a model row manufacturer you can now get in touch with a factory in china and have them make stuff for you all you've got to do is have the, the the sort of financial backing and the will to do it. But it is definitely um, possible that you can um, that that anybody can do it. And and you can see that we've got um, we've got more people coming into the hobby, more manufacturers. They they do they they're picking more unusual projects. You know who who would have thought a few years ago that we'd have had Port of Par locos coming out? Um, I get very frustrated because locos I built as kits years ago because I always wanted unusual stuff. And I was building a shunting layout. There weren't any shunters available at the time, um, or at least not, none that were any as good as I needed them to be. Um, stuff's turning up that is, um, that, that, that is that, that I would have built a kit for because there was no hope of it. I mean, you know, uh, Rapido's Y7, for example, when I had all my stuff stolen, the first loco that was replaced was the Y7 kit that I just built because Steve Barfield was able to give me a quote for building the Y7, which I could then use for the rest of the insurance stuff. Um, I got Steve to build me a Y7. Um, my Y7 is as good as the Rapido one. And it's, it, I'm, I'm pleased to say, but 
in a year's time, you're going to be able to buy a Rapido one off the shelf. And I would never have thought that. And it'll be a magnificent runner. It'll look incredible. Um, you know, there's lots of things. Uh, you know, Hormi, Hormi Peckett. I cannot build a Loco as good as Hormi Peckett. No two ways about it. It is an absolute gem. <laughs> um and you know and i and so that's that's changed so possibly in four mil generally the um generally the sort of the, the market is very full and if you just buy the locos that you need um you know you can probably get the locos off the shelf you can buy the wagons off the shelf um everything a lot of it is available and you can actually do a much more interesting like you're not stuck with a greater western branch line or something like that because mm -hmm. there are only a few things when i started um we would see three perhaps four major locomotives a month uh sorry i'm sorry year uh, announced now we think it's a thin month if we haven't got three new locos to review that's mm -hmm. that's the difference is quite simply just the amount of product coming out of there mm -hmm. but looking wider um with my garden rail hat on again um, I'm noticing more and more tiny businesses who are using laser cutting and increasingly 3D printing to produce, you know, quite obscure stuff. So cottage industries have not gone away. They've just changed. You know, in the 80s, cottage industries with somebody producing you some horrible lumps of white metal that were vaguely the right shape for a loco. Now the cottage industry, they're using 3D printing, they're using resin casting, they're using laser cutting um, to do the same sort of job. Yes, it's all very exciting, I think. Um, one of the frustrations I have is I'm a fan of Engage. Still not a lot of Engage around, but that's changing. You mentioned Rapido and Revolution Trains, obviously producing more Engage. And what I love about their model is the whole crowdfunding model, which is basically, if there's an appetite for it, if people want it, someone out there will build it. Is that what you're seeing? I think, I think Engage is the other big change, is that again, when I started, Engage meant some pool era Graham Farish that didn't work very well and didn't look very good. Now, um, the frustration I think we have more than anything is that there is some absolutely stunning Engage ready to run out there. I mean, no two ways about it. You mm. can point a camera at it, really, what should be a really cruel up um, image. No, it looks absolutely amazing. It's taking a while for the layouts to catch up with the Engage. We 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 have we always have an engage layout in each issue, right? So that's that's um, thirteen engage layouts a year, partly driven by the fact that the bloke who owns the company is an engage enthusiast. Um, <laughs> so he wants more. He wants to see plenty of engage. But we get such good. There is such good engage out there now that we have regularly had it on the cover of the magazine, because, and, and that's not probably something you'd have said five years ago. Mm -hmm. That you would have had you would have had engage on the cover because it just. It just didn't stand up to being looked at that closely, that big. And I think the other side, of course, is you look at O-Gage. You know, N-Gage is about 18% of the market. O-Gage is about 8% of the market. But it's, it's again, very, very achievable um, at, you know, not stupid prices. And, of course, not just N-Gage. What I get asked about a lot at the shows and in the videos I produce is, what about the O-Gage? What about G-Gage? There's definitely more of an appetite for the other gauges even though double o gauge still is the main player double, but... double o is the big player okay yeah, it's probably. still the biggest chunk of the market but um the other gauges are definitely becoming available if if i'm going to say there's a downside it's that as somebody who likes making stuff and i'm really in the hobby for making stuff i'm not I hate to say i'm not that fussed about the trains um <laughs> they are they are part of the scene but i'm i'm one of those people i want to make a nice looking scene and i am not going to argue about the nth degree of detail on these things because i don't actually think you see it in real life and i think you uh, so i i would rather build a nice scene but from the point of view of somebody who has built an awful lot of loco kits and really enjoys getting his hands getting dirty it's kind of pushing you out of those sort of areas so um, you look at it and think, well, yeah, where where is the space for people who like making stuff? Um, but it's still out there. If you, if you want to be the person who likes making stuff, you need to work in a weird scale. So three mil to the foot's great. Um, going larger is very popular and also going narrow gauge. I know there's a lot more 009 out there ready to run, but that just means it's reliable. Um, there's a lot of potential there. If you look at the 009 Society, they had their 50th anniversary event a few months ago. Uh, amazing show. And there was the beauty of it was all the narrow gauge layouts looked like narrow gauge layouts. They didn't look like a standard gauge layout. They'd just been laid in narrow gauge. It was people who'd gone and looked at the prototype. 
um, and they've got that lovely atmosphere around them. So it's brilliant. So yeah. it possibly possibly a downside of all the lovely ready to run is that it pushes the people who whose main interest in making things and detailing stuff, fiddling with things. Um, it pushes pushes them to elsewhere. But there are lots and lots of scales. There is something in this hobby for absolutely everybody. I'm definitely in your camp there, Phil. I particularly love the scenery side of it, the making side of it, maybe more than the locos. People, the people are very loud. <laughs> the ones are very picky about uh, about the very details on trains. Um, I had a chat. I think it was. I think this. I think this was. This was either Rapido or Acura scale chat. Chat. Um, they have one of their designers is very picky about making sure all the bolts on things are rotated slightly differently because <laughs> they've had moans that they've been lined up. And I'm afraid when somebody says when somebody moans about something like that, my answer is, can I see your layout? Because um, it must be breathtakingly amazing if you're telling me the bolts being lined up on that loco, the worst thing about it. Um, <laughs> and I, I do get a little bit frustrated when they, when they, when, when basically what it turns out is that I spent ages looking at the locomotive and it's gone in a box. You know, it's they've got a yard of track. They, they've got, they've undoubtedly got DCC. They've got a yard of track. They run the loco up and down, make all the noises, switch all the lights on and off, and then it goes back in the box. <laughs> and this thing, yeah. You're missing so much of the lovely creative side of the hobby, but. Mm -hmm. There is something in this hobby for absolutely everybody. And if that's your thing, then then that's great. And you must get this a lot. I see it at the shows. At the end of the day, a lot of the layouts have blurred into one, but then you'll see those standout layouts where you really see the craftsmanship and the passion and the love. The passion and love, and you're right. Every and everybody's standout layout is different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you will go around and look at a show and see something that's different. I will go around and show and look at something that's different. You know, obviously, I go around with a show with a slightly different eye to to perhaps most people on there because I've also trying to work out and what would look good if I did a set of photos. Of it. Um, because I'm conscious that what looks what what I really like probably isn't that commercial. You know, mm -hmm. I would get give I I would you know I, I okay I went to. Um, Rolleston on Dove show earlier this year had gone particularly to take photographs of a, of a building that David Wright had built. He and I had both built a model of Crooked House and I wanted to bring them together to photograph them. And he was up there. So I wandered around and there were some nice layouts. It was a lot, little, a lot of little shows punch above their weight as far as layout quality is concerned. This one certainly did. Um, I'd gone there. The, one of the layouts I wanted to look at was um, built in a beer barrel. Uh, has the most amazing <laughs> sky effects on it. best i've ever seen <laughs> but the one that caught my eye was a little french layout in the corner i can't touch it it's not a british layout but i really loved that layout and uh, i just looked at it and thought well, yeah beaut it was absolutely beautiful models everything was consistent across it every model fitted within the scene it was all the same level of dirt the same level of detail and it just it just all fitted together beautifully mm -hmm. uh and so, yeah, I mean, you do. Want, I think you do wander around, and some some will just catch your eye. I mean, at the same show, I picked up an engage that I photographed. I didn't know if it was going to be if it was going to stand up to the camera, so I actually I actually did a couple of proper shots, tripod, camera out, stacking the lot. Um, and I've since been back and photographed the layout because it's a really interesting concept. Essentially, it's two layouts back to back. Uh, works really well. Very small space. The funny thing was, when I did the photo shoot with him, he said, I saw you at the Engage show and you walked by me about four times. <laughs> and so, I, you know, uh, 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 the one, uh, this show, I'd looked at it and thought, I really like that. And I really like the concept. But I, so I did have to check that it was going to stand up to the, to the scrutiny because it was a great idea, but not all great. People have great ideas, but they don't always come off um, as far as, you know, the quality of modelling goes. Um, and I just hadn't seen him at Tings. And I don't know why. Because I I I'd gone layout shopping there, uh, and uh, I picked up a couple of layouts to shoot. And I just, this this one, perhaps it was just the way it was displayed at the show, or whatever. It just didn't it didn't leap out at me. So you know you have to go to a lot of events to go and find stuff. That's interesting, isn't it? You'll maybe see a layout at two or three different shows, but that one time it's a different day, a different time. Maybe you're in a different mood and you'll just see it in a different way. All of those things. Um, I think lighting makes a difference. I'm a big fan of layout lighting. It's a, one of those underrated subjects, but you need to put layout, light, lights on your layout at shows um, because light the layout properly and it improves the modeling by at least 50 percent it really it really does and it can be that just simply where it is in the show can be a problem i saw one i think it was 
one, one show I was at, there was a guy who'd built a full theatrical lighting rig for his layout. And it, you know, it could do everything. In fact, the lighting rig was big, about as big as the layout. It was obviously his thing. Unfortunately, he was placed opposite a plate glass, large plate glass window, and it was a very sunny day. And so, all his lighting effects were completely oh, they were completely flattened by the uh, by the by the light coming in. Um, if it had been a different place, where it had been a dark corner of the hall, his light would look completely different, and it may have just you know you may have gone wow um, in a way that you didn't go wow because it was you know the light spill was just too was just too strong for it. Speaking about how lighting and space make a difference, you and I have both been to Hornby's The Wonderworks in recent weeks. I'd love to know your opinion. What did you make of it? Uh, I I'd been a few, I'd been probably two or three times to the Hornby Visitor Centre as it was, and um, I always enjoyed it. Okay, um, but it was I suppose probably better aimed at somebody like me who is quite nerdy. I have a modest track collection of Triang trains including 18 giraffe cars but that's uh that's just, that's just me it is one of the greatest things ever made um the um i did i hope I, I got it you know and i'm interested i'm interested in the history of model railways as well i'm i'm interested in old kits i'm interested in old materials um that are out there and how how they work i i write a column for the hornby collectors club magazine and at the moment i'm building my way through some sort of old hornby buildings that are plastic kits that came out in the 1980s and that sort of thing um and I'm really interested in that. It's, it's slightly nerdy. And that's what Hormy Visitor Centre definitely delivered to me. But I, I, but I have to be realistic. Wonderworks is a much better tourist attraction. For the average family, you walk in there. I mean, the Visitor Centre, to be fair, it was done on a fairly small budget because I've talked to Dave, who's the head of the site there, and actually he's telling me about it. Um, it was done on a fairly small budget and it was looking tired. OK, so they did need to do something about it. Hornby is actually quite a significant tourist attraction down there anyway. Um, it's in Margate, you know, a combination of Margate, Ramsgate and then Broadstairs. You know, you've got to, you know, there, there are it, it's a holiday area. So you want to get families, you want to give families something they can go into in the rain because it does rain down there a bit as well. <laughs> the uh, um, And what they've done is they've made a very bright, airy tourist attraction. It's much easier to find your way around. And they have changed the emphasis in the cab in the now non-dusty cabinets that are there uh, so that there probably is a little bit less for the real nerdy people like me. Um, I was slightly surprised and uh, slightly surprised when I walked through the, the factory end of the business and the the mould for the Triang Tunnel is out there in a pile instead of uh, instead of being in the museum where it used to be when they explained plastic moulding. But um, that said, you walk around there, they've, they've done their level best to cram 100 years of history for five brands in there. There are a couple of, there's three great scale extra tracks you can play with. There are three very nice model railways running there, including one in TT. Um, <laughs> you can have a go with the latest version of their um, with of the tablets with their latest DC systems st stuff on it. Have a play with that. That's always popular when I've seen them at shows. It's always been very popular and it's installed with a very nicely set up set up there. So you've got two double O and one TT layouts. There's you know a selection of Porsche cars which are all museum quality and breathtakingly expensive. And I say breathtaking expensive working in Garden Rail, where uh, where 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 our like, where you know top end steam locos can cost four thousand uh, pounds. These Porsche cars are absolutely stunning. I would love to build one, really would. But uh, they uh, but you know when they're seven hundred quid, they are amazing to look at. The scale electric stuff is there. What what there is there is very sensibly they have covered less of how we used to do this in nineteen sixties. So yeah, you know, gone are the newspaper clippings with this Rovex in. Um, but uh, they've covered they've covered how they develop models now. So there's a nice development display of the turbomotive, for example, showing all the stages to up to producing um, producing um, finished shots. Um, there is the same for in the scale electric cabinet. Now, in the scale electric cabinet, below the current stuff with three D printing and mastering and all that sort of thing, there is also a cupboard full of um, how we used to do this with you know, three times scale things that would be pantograph milled down to uh, the scale you wanted and everything like that. Um, really interesting if something nerdy like me, less interesting to your average sort of eight year old. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what they've done is they've, I, I like it. I'm going to, I, I, 
I'll, I'm not on the fence this one. I like it. I like it. It's it's easy to wander around. It's bright. It's well lit. Um, it's not dusty. It's they've done their they've done their best not to make it boring. There is still a lot of history in there. I mean, there's a lot. Of, there there are less trying models than there used to be. Um, there are there's actually a surprising amount of um, old airfix stuff, but uh, sorry, old um, old scale electric stuff, and a reasonable amount of old airfix stuff in yeah. there. I agree with you, and I said this in my review of the Wonderworks. I really like it. I like the brightness. I like the space. What I found is there's a lot of information, but you maybe have to look for it. You have to get down lower. You have to look at all the cabinets and really read what's on offer. So yes, I liked it too. I think there's a lot for all ages, and I think that kind of ties in with discussions I've had with the team at Ormby. Uh, essentially, they Hornby has always seen themselves as a range maker. They make everything that you need to build a model railway. If you've ever got your paws on one of their family fun projects, everything is in the box, bar a baseboard. Um, and they are very keen. They see their role as bringing people in at the early stages. So they are the ones who make train sets. Be honest. It's only them a backman make train sets. You very you don't see many backman train sets. So essentially, train set equals Hornby, and they are pondering. And it's a, I think it's an, it's it's an it's always a question that these people ask is when they open the box of the train set, how do we then move them on to further into the hobby? Just not just to say that this train set is all the thing you need. No, the, there's a lot more to it, and the, then you've suddenly got so many aspects because you've suddenly have got. Um, scenery and operation and wiring and all the other stuff that we have to do yeah yeah right uh, so i think that ties in i think their their approach of trying to bring in or at least appeal to a very young crowd rather than rather than old rather than old dusty blokes who want to see endless or answer hormy double o um i think that's the right way to do it and i think they are doing the hobby a favor it's not something they can do easily if you look at model railway lands that get left in museums they always fall apart because mm -hmm. there's nobody to really look after them mm -hmm. um uh, a layout that's going to work day in day out as a tourist attraction is a very different beast to the sort of um you know the, the sort of things that we will build but we can also maintain so phil keen blogger write a lot on your blog but what some may not know about you is that you're also a novelist an author tell me more about the books you've written uh yes um a friend of mine Can candice nolan and i started writing a book and the gist of it was i mean, I mean it, it is light chiclet which is something i'd never read and it's like um and it was basically the the gist of it is what happens if you if you are yeah if, if you meet the one who got away at university and you're there to close the place he works down um <laughs> and so it's a it's basically based on our own experiences. So we started out, the first book is called Kate versus the Dirt Boffins. Um, the Dirt Boffins are um, horticulture, uh, sort of agricultural research scientists, because I worked at a place that I've mentioned, horticulture research, where there, there were loads of scientists and uh, they had some interesting, um, they had some interesting quirks. And so we set it there. And basically we were, we were working our way through various places. We were closing them down and with this sort of overarching, um love story on there the rules being very clearly that candice was definitely of the opinion that we were not going to have a traditional chiclet hero she is not sitting there pining for a man um and that's that's all about she is very much kick ass she set up her own business she she does this um dave who is the the love interest it's a little bit will they won't they they will i mean let's face it it's what's gonna happen at the end of the series it's got <laughs> one thing i will say is model railways is a very very handy hobby um for lots of things in life okay i mean i i did the blogging because i was doing because i was working on in it and looking after a website and um but i learned how to talk to people you're standing behind a lag you have to talk to people so you have to deal with people all the time i got used to, you know i did a lot of um i i yeah, I, I did a lot of conference work where I was standing on stage talking to people, but I wasn't scared of it because I was used to talking to people at, at events all the time. And so, yeah, it's been um, from a from a practical point of view, because we have very it's great working with somebody who has a very, very different take on stuff. You know, I have learned a lot. I mean, I have learned that 750 quid is a very reasonable price to pay for a handbag, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, you, you think that's bad? National Row Museum or, or Shildon. Um, they have got a selection of handbags on there, twelve hundred and fifty quid, and they're not putting them on the web. They're they're not putting them in the shops because they've all sold out on the website. Flying mm -hmm. Scotsman handbags, and I'm like, how? 
seriously <laughs> but you know people complain model railways is expensive um but it's really interesting just having somebody's completely different take and working with somebody on this and that's the thing i love i love working as part of teams because you get that interaction and you get that different you get those sort of different opinions mm -hmm. so this is this is this is an extension of just stuff I do but it's so different from what I do normally it's great fun it's a nice refresher hearing about your career progression and it really sounds like it's been about following your passion doing the things you like and the rest has kind of aligned is that how you would sum it all up I, I've been very lucky in the sense that I've done the stuff I've done stuff I like and I've taken opportunities when they come up so you know when I was doing when I when I was doing the the, the society journal you know that's that's something I wasn't getting paid for that was that was part of the fun but it gave me other opportunities and then other opportunities some opportunities have fallen out of those and I do make the effort to be places the the thing I like more than anything else in this whole job is I really like talking to other modelers and other people are enthusiasts okay I love talking to enthusiasts doesn't matter what topic they're in you know any it doesn't matter what hobby they're doing if you talk to enthusiasts that's great and I will say you never know what's gonna what what comes out of this thing if you go out there and go and talk to people and uh, get involved and just do the stuff you really love. At some point, somebody's going to say, yeah, that's that's interesting and something will come out of it. Lovely. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Phil. Thanks so much. Oh, very very much enjoyed today. it. Lovely. Thanks. If you like this video, please like, share and of course, subscribe. And please hit the bell to be notified of all my future videos.